I was getting ready to sleep when I received the call. It was from a no-caller ID. I sat there at the edge of the bed, phone to my ear. Hello? I could hear someone clearing their throat from the other end of the line. And then, a deep, formal voice piped up. Good evening. Am I speaking to Alex at the Yemi? You are, I answered. Who's this? I was up to my neck in cold calls from strangers who wanted to sell me car insurance and was ready to tear the caller a new one, when he explained. I'm calling about the caregiver role for Granger Manor. Those words chased the sleep out of my eyes. I sat up straight. Me and my girlfriend were saving up for our wedding, but with only 10 months left, we needed every penny we could get. I needed a part-time job, and I needed one fast. But finding a good, decent job these days was like finding water in the Sahara. So it's no surprise that I applied for this caregiver vacancy two minutes after it went live on Indeed. We like your CV and would like to invite you for an interview. The caller continued. His voice was soft, silky smooth. So smooth, it was almost unnerving. He sounded like one of those ASMR YouTubers. Would you be free tomorrow morning? 8.30 a.m. to be exact? I didn't miss a beat. I'll be there. I never expected them to call me back half an hour after I applied. 11 at night, no less. But I just assumed they were as desperate for employees as I was to earn some money on the site. It was a match made in heaven. The interview was done over Zoom. The next morning, I sat at my dining room table, hunched over my laptop, headphones pressed into my ears as I joined the call. The video call flickered to life, and a middle-aged man appeared on my screen. He introduced himself as Damien. No surnames, just Damien. He looked as professional as he sounded, slicked back dark hair as black as night, well-groomed beard, suit and tie. He smiled, but if there was even a shred of warmth left in that smile, it didn't reach his pale blue eyes. The corners of his mouth were pulled back just a little too far, revealing teeth that were unnaturally even and white, as if he spent a lifetime polishing them to perfection. He asked all the usual questions. What are your weaknesses? What do you believe are the most important qualities for a caregiver to possess, and how do you demonstrate them? Why do you think you're a good fit for this company? I bullshitted my way through the interview. I asked a few questions of my own too. There were barely any traces of the care home on the internet, and I was curious about that. Damien glanced up at me. His smile never wavered, but his eyes held a flicker of something unreadable. It looked a little like surprise. Ah. Yes. He began, his voice measured and calm. We pride ourselves on maintaining a private and exclusive environment for our residents. Many of them prefer a more discreet approach away from the prying eyes of the public. It sounded like he was reading from a rehearsed script. I ignored the red flags. Looking back at it, I ignored a lot of red flags. Money sometimes makes you blind. In the end, I got the job. I started work the next evening. I kissed Celine goodbye and was out the door. The place was a 45 minute drive from our house in the crack ass middle of nowhere. Frank Ocean sang his heart out on the car radio as I sped through the highway on a foggy night. The long road ran through the woods and I drove past miles and miles of tall birch trees that stretched up to the cloudy sky. All around me, there was nothing but forest. The care home was settled at the end of a quiet street in a gated community. It was an old school bungalow with neatly trimmed bushes and colorful flower beds on the lawn. I parked up, stepped out, and headed to the front door. Just as I raised my hand to knock, the door creaked open, revealing a tall man in the dimly lit hallway. Good evening, Damien said with that smooth yet hollow voice. Alex, was it? I nodded swallowing the lump in my throat. Yes, that's right. I shook his hands. Nice to meet you. Something about the man gave me unease. Come in. He stepped aside with an almost mechanical grace. We've been expecting you. Anything to drink? Coffee? Water? No thanks, I'm good. The door closed behind me with a soft thud. 
the tall man gestured for me to follow him down a narrow hallway, and with each step, the unease in my chest tightened its grip. The radio was playing softly in the background. As I listened, the crackly voice became clearer. We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to bring you a special report. We have just received word that Pearl Harbor, Hawaii has been attacked by Japanese forces. I repeat, Pearl Harbor has been attacked. Damien must have noticed my curiosity. You're probably wondering why we play old news broadcasts like this one. He chimed in, his voice steady. It's not just for nostalgia's sake, although that does play a part. It's about keeping a connection to the past alive, especially for our older residents. Now that he mentioned it, the entire house looked like it was frozen in the past. The furniture in the living room matched the vintage feel. Plush armchairs with floral upholstery sat alongside polished wooden side tables. A few framed black and white photographs adorned the wall, capturing memories from what seemed like a distant past. Smiling faces at family gatherings, couples dancing at social events, a little girl building a sandcastle, a slender ballerina posing on her tiptoes. Even the light fixtures with their frosted glass shades seemed to belong to another era. The soft, dim glow they poured into the room added to the cozy, yet eerie atmosphere. It looked like how you'd expect an old people's home to look. There was only one thing missing. Where are all the residents? I thought out loud. Damien stopped abruptly. Apart from the ticking of the grandfather clock on the wall and the crackle of wood from the fireplace, there was no sound apart from the news reporter on the radio. He turned to me with that signature smile that was stitched onto his face, his eyes pale as snow. I must inform you that the nature of this role is quite unique. He cleared his throat. Alex, you see, the resident you will be providing companionship to is not a living person. S say what? The words caught in my throat. The individual in question is not alive. Well, at least not in the conventional sense. You will be tasked with watching over their ashes. He went on. This is an afterlife care agency. We care for those whom society had forgotten. Those who passed away with a dying wish to be remembered and loved from beyond the grave. Many of our clients are folks who died alone, with no one in their lives, no living husbands or wives, no children, no friends to mourn their losses. As he spoke, my gaze drifted to a corner of the room where a small ornate urn rested on a side table. It dawned on me that the client in question was the pile of cremated ashes in that urn. We're understaffed at the moment, so we've had to outsource some of our work across the country. It's a rather unconventional responsibility, I understand, so if this isn't what you were expecting, it's perfectly. I was on my way to the door before he even finished his sentence. Oh hell nah! The pay would be $2,000 per night, he added, stopping me in my tracks. We've already wired this night's pay to your account. I pulled out my phone and saw the PayPal notification signaling that $2,000 had landed safely in my account. I don't even know how they got my account details. That's how I started looking after Miss Ferguson's ashes. Damien explained that Miss Ferguson had died of a brain aneurysm. Right on that chair, he pointed. Three weeks had passed before anyone noticed. The mailman came to deliver a letter one morning, and when he saw the unopened letters flooding the mailbox and smelled the stench of rot, he alerted the police. And there, they found her body, slumped on that chair. No one was named in her will. Her only request was for her savings to be invested into her after life care, and for her ashes to be scattered at a beach. And so, here we were. There were rules that I had to follow each night. Damien handed me a document that listed them all. Rule number one, ensure all doors and windows are securely locked by midnight. Do not open until the end of shift. No exceptions. Rule number two, if you hear the sound of crying, Remain perfectly still until it passes. Do not under any circumstances make a sound. Rule number three. Do not sleep on the job. Rule number four. 
Do not look into any mirrors after midnight. Rule number five. Do not open the bedroom door at the end of the hallway. You must not, under any circumstances, break these rules, Alex. Damien finished. For the first time, the smile faded from his face. He was dead serious. Got it, I said. My schedule was the same each night. I polished the tables, vacuumed the carpets, dusted the bookshelves, and played Miss Ferguson's favorite songs on the record player. She apparently loved jump blues music, so every night I played Boogie Woogie Boggle Boy back to back. For the most part, it was a decent job. I had no supervisor, so sometimes I just laid on the couch watching Joe Rogan until sunrise, then I'd clock out at 7am, rinse repeat. I didn't hear the sound of crying until the fourth night. I was in the house all by myself. I remained as still as a mannequin, my heart beating in my chest, frozen, paralyzed by fear as I heard the sobbing. Sure, Damien did warn me about the crying, but I didn't expect it to actually happen. I strained my ears to listen, but the sound was faint and muffled, like it was coming from inside the walls themselves almost as though they didn't want anyone to hear. But then, the crying got louder and louder. And then, it was followed by the sound of scratching. Nails scratching furiously from inside the walls. That was the last straw. As soon as the crying stopped, I got up out of there. I left the house keys under the doormat. My phone was ringing up a storm as I reversed out of the driveway. Damien must have been alerted that the door was opened. I put it on loudspeaker and pressed the gas pedal to the floor. What are you doing, Alex? There was no more politeness in Damien's voice. I'm quitting. Don't worry. I'll pay back tonight's wage. But I've entertained this crazy shit long enough. Mr. Adeyemi, you're making a mistake. Listen, I'm not spending one more night in that madhouse. There are rules. You broke them. Please don't call me again. Mr. Adeyemi, I urge you to. I hung up the phone. When I finally stepped through my front door, the familiar warmth of my home began to ease my nerves. I collapsed to sleep on the sofa. Later that morning, I stirred awake to the sound of soft footsteps. Celine was already up by 7 in the morning, her eyes full of concern as she gently shook my shoulder. Hey, she said, her voice a soothing balm. You okay? You look like you barely slept. She handed me a cup of coffee. I rubbed my eyes and managed a tired smile. Rough night, I admit it, the memories of the care home still fresh in my mind. She frowned, worry etched across her face. You don't have to keep pushing yourself so hard, she said, kissing me on my forehead. We can figure things out together. I know, I reached for her hand. I just want everything to be perfect for us. It already is, as long as we're together, she squeezed my hand and smiled gently. Just had my performance review, been pushing for that senior product manager role. If I get it, it'll make things a little easier for us. That's great, babe. I know you'll get it. She probably noticed how distracted I was. You sure you're okay, Lex? From that point forward, I heard nothing more from Damien. No text messages, no calls, radio silence. The job posting was no longer live on Indeed, and I didn't have the man's number so calling him wasn't an option. I wanted to clear the air, to make sure he wouldn't break into my house one night and slip cyanide in my coffee. The silence was killing me, the uncertainty, the dread of not knowing what he was thinking. I drove back to Miss Ferguson's house, but there was no one there. Someone had stuck up a for sale sign on the lawn. It was as if the whole ordeal had never happened. Four nights that were blotted out of history, Life went back to usual for the most part. At that point, I hadn't told Celine what had happened, not about the special requirements of the job, the weird rules, or the muffled crying I heard from inside the walls. I didn't want to worry her. She had enough on her plates. Everything would go back to normal, I convinced myself. I was wrong. One morning, as I got up to brush my teeth, I glanced in the mirror and saw the reflection of an old lady standing behind me. I spun around and saw no one there. But when my eyes drifted back to the mirror, there she was again, impossibly thin and frail, draped in a tattered nightgown, 
leaning on a cane. Her eyes were red and teary. She had been crying. At the office, I'd see her lithe frame in toilet mirrors. Her silent eyes were now dead, as though she had run out of tears. There she was in the corner of my bedroom at night, her silhouette lurking in the dark, walking aimlessly, drifting at the corner of my eyes. But when I looked directly at her, she'd vanish again. Everywhere I went, I'd hear the tap, tap, tap of that cane as she followed me, but she was invisible to everyone else. It didn't take long for me to start losing my appetite. I ate less. My eyes became sunken, hollow from the sleepless nights. I lost some weight, and my face was gone. I stopped going to the office because I was terrified. I locked myself in my house and hid under the covers. That was the only place I was safe from her. I had no choice but to confess everything to Celine. She did what she could to support. She set up appointments with a therapist, stayed awake with me after my night terrors, took time off work to be around more. But still, I drifted slowly into the deep end of madness. We ended up cancelling the wedding, but the torture didn't stop there. Soon, I began seeing Miss Ferguson's urn in random places too. I stepped into my bedroom one evening, and there it was, sitting on my nightstand, as if it had always been there. Each time I found it, I tried to get rid of it, moving it to the attic, locking it in the basement, even throwing it out with the trash. But no matter what I did, it always returned, undisturbed and pristine. And if it wasn't the urn haunting me, it was the old lady with that cane of hers. Tap, tap, tap. Maybe she's trying to tell you something, Celine suggested one night. We were laying on the sofa together as I ran my hand through her hair. Miss Ferguson was staring at us from the corner of the room. I tried to ignore her. Is she here with us now? Celine asked. Yeah, she's right there. I pointed to beside the dining room table. I could see that made Celine uneasy. She shifted slightly, her body tensing. Perhaps she just needs something to be at peace. Celine added, her eyes lingering on the corner of the room. Perhaps. I was suddenly reminded of Miss Ferguson's will. She wanted her ashes to be scattered at a beach. I might have an idea. That following morning, I stepped out of my front door for the first time in what felt like an eternity. I squinted at the blinding sunlight, feeling the fresh morning breeze on my face. It was a 50 mile drive to the closest beach. The open road stretched out ahead, winding through coastal towns and past towering cliffs laced with wildflowers swaying in the gentle breeze. Miss Ferguson's urn was riding shotgun on the front seat. The world outside my car seemed to slow down. You have a lot of time to think about everything when you're out on the road. And that whole journey, all I could think about was Miss Ferguson. I had so many questions. What did she do for a living? Did she have any children? Was she ever married? Why did she want her ashes to be scattered at the beach? I never cared to ask Damien any of these questions. But all of a sudden, these things seemed to hold more weight, more value. Finally, the beach appeared in the distance, a stretch of sand bordered by rugged cliffs and soft waves. I parked the car and stepped out onto the sand, the green swarm beneath my feet. The wide ocean stood before me, stretching into the distance forever. The sun was still climbing over the horizon. I hired one of the small boats from the fishermen and paddled it out until I was far out in the calm waters. I sat there for a moment with Miss Ferguson's ashes. It was quiet out there, nothing but the lapping of the waves, the faint cries of the seagulls above, the breeze of the wind. All you wanted was to be cherished by someone. I said to no one in particular, then, it all hit me. All of my emotions collided like a car speeding into oncoming traffic. The fear, the sleepless nights, the confusion, the numbness, all of it mingled with a deep sense of sadness. The sadness I felt, for Miss Ferguson, for all the years she felt alone, isolated, 
forgotten. Tears fell from my eyes before I realized I was crying. With trembling hands, I opened the urn. I'm sorry. It must have been so lonely. So painful. I said. But this isn't where you belong. You can let go. You can find peace now. I scattered her ashes into the sea. And as I watched it drift away, I felt a heaviness lift off from my shoulders. I never saw Miss Ferguson again. After that, 